Perfect. All right. You ready, Mark? I am ready. Let me just get this right. off my screen. <laughs> Chris, you ready? I'm ready. All right. Let's have some fun today, gentlemen. All right. All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the HR revolution or evolution, no matter what way you look at it. The field of HR is changing and evolving just like the world of work. Um, today, we have conversations with individuals like Mark, um, who Chris will introduce shortly here, um, to learn from their experience. Mark comes with us with over 40 years of experience, and, and two, our listeners, probably tap into your years of intellectual and social capital that you have under your belt, or maybe you don't yet. This show is really all about teaching the, the future generations of HR or current HR practitioners and professionals, as well as CEOs that are looking to get back in touch with their people and what their people actually want. Um, so my co-host today is Chris Darone. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate it. And as Kevin said, everybody, really happy to be back um, to provide this podcast to all of you out there. Um, hopefully you enjoy it as much as we enjoy having the conversations with our HR leaders. Today's guest is no exception. It's Mark Guthrie. Mark has extensive experience as a skilled HR executive and leader. He's held leadership roles at General Electric, Keurig, Dr. Pepper, and most recently the Hertz Corporation. Mark is also a trusted expert in the HR industry when it comes to establishing equitable and productive employee relations and labor relations policies. He is also just a really nice guy and an overall good person to boot. So that makes this really, really, really fun. On behalf of Kevin and myself, we want to thank you, Mark, for taking time out of your busy day to join us and welcome you to the show. Well, hey, first off, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm glad to be here and, and I'm retired now. So my days aren't quite as busy as they <laughs> once were. But uh, yeah, I've, I've been blessed. I've had a, a, I had a great career uh, spanning over 40 years uh, Started out with a general electric company, actually co-op with GE through college, and then worked for them over 32 years. And at the time I left GE, I was responsible for personnel relations for the, the non-union population of General Electric, which was roughly 270,000 people around the world. And we had a great team helping us manage that. Uh, left GE on my own accord and actually started consulting and was qu quite busy. I had a lot of folks that would call me and say, hey, you know, I knew of you from GE. Can you come help us and do some of the things for my new company that you did for GE? And I enjoy that. But two times post GE, I've had situations where G former GEers have called me and said, hey, we've got a role where you think you can help us and would you please consider? And one was at Keurig. So I was with Keurig for a couple of years and had an absolute blast working with the team. That's where I met Chris. Yep. And, um, you know, I just had a really, really fun time working with the operations team at, at Keurig. And, you know, changing that company and positioning it where it was actually purchased by a private entity. And at that time I left, chose to leave and um, went to consulting again. Then had another call from some former GE colleagues at Hertz. So I went to Hertz. Again, the intent was helping on the operations side of the house and did that for about two years. And then some of you may be aware, Hertz actually went into bankruptcy as a result of COVID back in uh, the May of 2020 timeframe. And I actually got appointed to be CHRO up to the time I retired in late uh, 2020. So you know, I've been a blessed person. I've worked with a lot of just tremendous individuals. I feel like I've, I've, I've tapped a lot of good folks to help me be productive in my roles. I've traveled the world. I've been to 70 countries on six continents and seen a lot of cool things. And, you know, really appreciate you all giving me a chance to kind of share some of the gospel according to Mark, I guess, here <laughs> for your podcast today. So thank you. I appreciate that. Uh well, I expect you to hit that seventh continent in retirement, Mark. So <laughs> just, you're that close. You just have to do that. I don't know. We'll see. Probably <laughs> not. Uh, well, Mark, we always like to get to know our guests um, because oddly, probably when you were at Hertz and, and probably at GE, um, your friends, your peers are were surprised that you may have had a life outside of work. Um, so <laughs> they might have thought that you had a cot right in your office there some days. So I guess as you're traveling around the world, um, one of my favorite things to, to ask, what was the favorite, what's the best place that you ever, you've ever been or most interesting place you've you ever been? You know, my favorite city outside of, you know, being in America is Barcelona, Spain. That's a beautiful city. There's a lot of culture, a lot of history. And uh, I was fortunate at the time that I, most of the time I spent in Barcelona was right after the 92 Olympics. So they really revamped the city and it was just a, a wonderful time to be there. I've probably been to Barcelona 30 times. I've never seen a cloud in the sky. It's just a wow. beautiful place, festive folks, 
you know, great cuisine. If you're into the nightlife, it's it's crazy, but that's that's a cool place. <laughs> but I, but I, my wife and I love the islands, so we're big in the Caribbean, and uh, we we kind of found Aruba as our kind of our spot to go. And we spent time there by ourselves, but we've also taken the family there as well on holiday, and uh, you know, really enjoy that. So th- that'd be kind of two of my favorite places that I I want to be. I'm a, I'm a Caribbean junkie too. I, I, love, cool. that, I love that weather and that blue water. Give it to me. <laughs> and don't go below 70 because that sounds perfect to me. <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's awesome, Mark. Another question we like to ask people is, um, you know, if you're if you're driving around your car, you know, just kind of going from place to place, what what do you got on the radio station? What are you listening to? You know, what really gets you in a mood that makes you feel like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm digging this. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a 70s guy, right? So I'm a big Earth, Wind & Fire guy. So anything Earth, Wind & Fire. Yes. I, uh, nice. As a matter of fact, my 60th birthday, one of my gifts was seeing them in concert front row seats in Atlanta. So I, uh, uh-huh. yeah, everybody's wondering, Where, who's this big white dude? <laughs> Where are all the words of his songs, man? Who is this guy? And, you know. I, I just I that, I'm into that. So if I got XM radio on, I'm listening to the 70 station. Nice. And, uh, that, that's what I enjoy. Just it's kind of like the I'd say the time the time uh, you know the time life of my of my life is all tied to their their music. So I love oh, it. That's so cool. Well, let's let's kind of jump right into it because you you mentioned it earlier. You talked about being in in this field for over 40 years. Um, your favorite music back in the 70s was probably right before you were choosing to come into this field. Yeah. I always like to know how people found their way because I would guesstimate that back in back when you first started joining the world of HR, that it was personnel at that time. It was. What got what got you interested in it, Mark? Because it wasn't that sexy and it wasn't really that prominent of a of a business unit or function at that time. It was kind of by accident. So I went to college. I'm, I'm a Tar Heel, so I went to UNC, and my what I wanted to be was a sports writer. So I went with the intent of you know going to journalism school at UNC and coming out and being a sports writer and, and you, you hear now in the media talking about 40 years ago all these things that are happening now hadn't been so bad for 40 years well that was when I came out of college so it was a tough market you know I, I had an offer with one newspaper in North Carolina and, and it really wasn't exactly what I wanted to do when it wasn't sports related so GD offered me a job as an hourly employee you know uh, so a college graduate going to g as an hourly employee but it turned out what they paid me to be an hourly employee was more than what i was going to make at the newspaper for the offer, or my job offer so i decided i would do that until i figured out what i wanted to do so started work at ge and i uh, worked on the floor making nuclear fuel rotating shifts i'm working day shift night shift graveyard shift which was very insightful for me and quite honestly what i learned okay. on the shift work for three years helped me tremendously later in the jobs I had in HR. But so I'm doing this job, doing this job, thinking, where am I going to go? I started graduate school, let G pay for me to get an MBA. And lo and behold, a a communicator's job came open at this facility that I was working at. Yeah, so I'll put my journalism degree to work. I'll go be the site communicator. So I went and applied for communications. And it turned out that communications rolled up under HR. So didn't know anything about HR. I kind of saw HR and kind of thought, well, this, you know, this is interesting stuff. And, you know, oh, by the way, I remember as an hourly person how people thought of human resources. Exactly. Back then it was called employee and community relations is what it was called in, in the GE model. And so we had this guy, and I'm not going to mention his name because he's still living, but he, he was our HR person. And we only saw him once a month when we were on day shift. And he would come around and he would say, what's your deal? And I, he'd tell him he'd write it down in a little spiral notebook and he'd put it in his pocket and he'd leave. You'd see him a month later when you're on day shift and you say, hey, uh, what about my water? I, I'll get back with you. I don't have it quite yet. I'll get back with you. And this would go on for months until finally you just gave up, right? And so I'm doing this communicator's job and an HR job opened up and, and, and I said, I can do that job. And, and so what do you think you can do? I just think I can do the job. So I went into the interview and the, the hiring manager said, why do you think you can do this job? I said, look, this is the simplest job here on site. He said, what do you do? <laughs> All you got to do is get a spiral notebook and run around and write down what people want and not do anything about it. And he's like, what are you talking about? And I told him, he said, you're hired. And so from there, I kind of built what I think my reputation was on is getting back with people, working with people. And, you know, people come to you in HR with an issue of concern. You know, a lot of times they just want somebody to listen. But then when you can act upon these things, how do you do that? And how do you go about helping problem solve? And so that's kind of how I got in HR. And then and I was blessed. I, I, I was able to work into some pretty, um, you know, high, high visibility locations where some good things happened and things kind of aspired to be, 
you know, I, I, I got sent to Europe for three years, which was a game changer for not only my family, but for me personally, because I got to see how GE operated outside the U.S. And then when I got larger responsibility in my jobs, when I came back to America, where I was working globally, a lot of the folks I met when I was in Europe for three years were also aspiring to be, and they became key leaders, and we were working together. So, so I had a credibility, I had a relationship, I had a rapport, I could build on that to help me with my personal success. So work well for GE, kind of work well for me. So kind of went back, hourly employee, you know, took the plunge and tried to use my degree, had no idea communications rolled up under HR, saw HR, said, no, I know I can do this, and it went from there. So I was very, very fortunate. That's amazing, Mark. And a couple of things that stood out to me is just your experience on the floor, as you said it, you know, having that experience seeing what work was like as you know one of one of the hourly employees of the company so when you go to hr when you went into hr you had that you know knowledge of here's what's really happening here's what's going on i'm, I'm sure that that helped out uh, i guess my question would be so where did you find the time to just kind of learn as an hr professional was it just through the job did they just throw you kind of out there having the communications background probably helped but it did, but did I, really I, I, I was, I was HR skills. I was blessed, Chris. My, my very first HR job, I was the third shift uh, HR person for an operation. It had about 300 people on third shift and about 13 supervisors. And I worked crazy hours. I worked from like one in the morning until nine in the morning. And, and the first thing, the last thing I did every shift was I sat down with the, the senior HR journalist who was just a terrific individual. He was a former pro football player in the early 60s with the Buffalo Bills. Just a, he and I are still friends today. Great guy named Monroe Phelps. And I'll say his name because I love Monroe. He's still living. And I would sit down with Monroe every day and I would have a list of things that I went through the night before. And he would help me go, I do this, do that, think about this, how about you do that? And so every morning I would do that with Monroe. And then that night I would go back and follow up with the folks. So go back into the, is there follow up or not? I was following up and people were like, oh, you never had anybody follow up before. And so just having those conversations with Monroe every morning for all those, you know, almost two years, what I learned from that was just, you know, it was better than a college education. I mean, he had so much institutional knowledge that he shared with me, and it was just open kimono. Everything he would talk about and cared about what I was doing and, you know, made me think, you know, maybe come up with problems. Just he didn't have all, even if he had the end, what do you think we should do and why? And, and you know, make me learn and make me grow. And that was a big deal to me. And I use that same philosophy going forward as my career grew with yeah. folks who work for me and saying, hey, I, how, how can I help them like Monroe helped me? That's great. That's great. I think those mentor mentee relationships, Mark, like you mentioned, is, is typically bi-directional, I think, when 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 they they happen naturally. And I think that the that kind of is a give and take and 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 both parties are learning at the same time. Something that you said a couple of times in, in, in kind of my key takeaways from what you were saying earlier is I heard credibility, I heard accountability, and I heard building relationships. Yeah. And, and I think the, what you were touching on, obviously, with the experience that you had in working those different shifts is that you had a better understanding and awareness of the lives and the challenges and the stressors that these people are bringing in these particular roles with them to these hours or these times of day um, and how challenging that could be. Chris and I talk about, and Chris was sharing before the show, um, and I hope you don't mind, but how great of a leader that you were when you guys worked together at Keurig. Um, he mentioned how off, awesome or emotionally intelligent that you were. Before that was probably a keyword back then, um, to just invite Chris into your office, ask him about his family, ask him about what's going on. Um, and I think that you, your relationship at this stage of your career carried you forward, um, like you said, in everything else that you did moving forward. Where I wanted to ask the question is, it sounds like it takes that accountability, that credibility and building the relationships to establish the trust necessary within the business to drive change, Absolutely. Or necessary change. That, that's the nail on the head right there. I mean, did you feel like you were a leader at that point? And do you feel like we need more leadership within HR as we start to hear rumblings of unionization where businesses are so out of touch with their people is it because they just weren't hearing hr or I, I think it's a combination and i think you know again if i, if I go back and i look at my career and, and things that, that helped me 
when I when I left my first operation, which was Wilmington, North Carolina, I went to Ohio to a, a, a facility that was in GE's lighting division, the quartz division of lighting. And it was a self-directed workforce. Okay, the place opened up in 1973 as a self-directed workforce. I got there in '88. And there were seven members of staff, and then there was the rest of the non-exempt workforce. And this was a, a tremendous workforce. These folks were smart, only four job classifications. And when you got there, they had a rule that you had to, what they call, walk a mile in my shoe. So every role in the plant, the four job classifications, you had to work on each shift. Yep. And you had to do that starting out your first week on the job. And you couldn't stop until you touched all the areas. Yep. And so I thought, well, this is, what, what's all this about? Once I did that at that site, everywhere I went after that, I did it again. Because what I learned from that, the credibility, you know, I started playing on the, the plant softball team. You, know, you learned about kids playing football. Before my family moved up, I'd go watch the local high school team play and watch employees' kids play football. And, you know, they had the Babe Ruth Little League series going on in town. I'd go out there and see that and see folks. And it yeah. just start making that connection when they said, look, first off, he's a human, okay? And oh, he likes sports, whatever. And then you build off that because what you're going to find is life is not perfect business isn't perfect and if you have a rapport with the workforce where they trust you they'll work with you through the ups and downs right. if they don't know you and can't trust you it's like oh gosh what are we going to do now and believe me I, I got some scars that i learned early on my career on going through these things but at the end of the day to me it was all about those relationships you know every time i got a job i had a one-on-one -on -one with everybody that was on my staff Everybody was on the staff I was supporting. And then I said, let me come to your staff meeting. Let me meet your people. Let me get out and about. Let sure. me travel to find out what's going on in the business. And I did that the first 60, 90 days to just absorb to hear what was really happening. Then you get into a position where you can help problem solve and help figure out what was going on. And then Kevin, to your point, I could always go back to my two years, two and a half years working rotating shift you know, graveyard shift, weekends, holidays, all these things, and think about what I went through in that role and hearing long service employees share their opinions about that and factor that into workplaces where we had rotating shift, whatever, to say, I, I think I know a little bit about that, or I could say, look, I've done that before. I, and it wasn't for a week, it was for two and a half years. And, and here's what I learned. What's it like? What, what are you experiencing? And you had that credibility to build off. Yeah, that's fantastic. So, Mark, one of the questions there that, you know, that we had on our list for you, and I think it's really important for today, is just the, the evolution of leadership, you know, and the change in kind of leadership behaviors that we've seen over time. And, you know, coming from GE, where, you know, there's a lot of conversations around the performance management process and how employees were, were managed to kind of modern, say modern day leadership behaviors and leadership traits. What do you see as the, like the key behaviors that leaders today need to demonstrate in order to be effective in their roles? Well, to me, it's all about, it's the relationship piece, but to me, it starts with communications. And I think if, if you're in a leadership role, aren't a good communicator, both, you know, in, on your feet yeah. and also in writing, and, and you know, now it's, you know, it's text, it's, it's email, it's whatever. You know, we've gotten away from having the dialogue with folks, and I, and I hate that, but I think what's important is you got to be able to articulate the message, and you got to be able to do it pretty quickly. Yeah. You've also got to be visible, available, accessible, and responsive. It's those four things, visible, available, accessible, responsive. Visible, where I know you're around. Accessible, you know, if I sit here and say, okay, uh, if, if, if I want to talk with Mark, can I get to him, right? And I really make myself available for time to to chat through whatever's on your mind, and then I'm responsive about it. And today, in, in today's virtual world, couldn't be more important. So I, you know, I, I kind of changed how I did my job in Hertz with the pandemic because we had to doing more things virtually. But I wanted to make sure for one on ones, I'd say, look, for those of you who are here, I'll meet you face to face if you want. If you want a virtual, I'm fine. If if we talk enough during the week where you think you don't want one, that's fine. I'll spend my time with other people. But I think the leader has to be visible available visible accessible available responsive all four things for to have that connection with the workplace if the only time i see you or talk with you or interact with you when something's wrong okay how often do you want to see or interact with me probably never right you don't, you don't. Yeah. So I'm sitting there saying okay and then 
then it goes back to the personal side. You know, I can remember going to, to, to Keurig and I wanted to get the birthday list for everybody to work for me. Well, we can't give you the birthday list. It's confidential information. I'm like, I want to send people a card for their birthday. You know, we can't give you that. I'm like, okay, well, then I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. Because I want, you know, to me, it's, it's to say, hey, look, you're a special day or you, you had a loss of a pet or you had a child graduate from college. You know, congratulations. You got one off the payroll, you know. <laughs> Good for you. And I know it's exciting times for you guys. And, you know, whatever it is, the loss of a grandparent, to let people know that you know that they have a life outside of work and you want to build on that as you go forward, you know, with your own per, you know, personal life. And, and I learned the hard way because I, I spent so much time early in my career at GE trying to aspire to be thinking that my, by me providing well for my family, that I was doing right by them where there was things that I missed with my family that I tell people later in my career not to miss. Go, family first, connect, be there for that. You know, cats in the cradle, he learned to walk while I was away. My oldest son learned to walk while I was away. Don't do that, be connected, do the things that you gotta do with your family because if you feel connected with your family, you're gonna come to work and be a more productive employee. Yeah, that's great. Man, Thank so you. much in that, um, Mark, that that I'd love to dive into and, and, and continue to dive a little bit deeper on. Um, you talked about making that personal connection. Um, I think today, uh, post-pandemic, or we're still kind of in the pandemic, that same personal personalization or that same expectation to every individual, um, maybe it's conditioned thanks to Netflix, thanks to Amazon, you know, where things are, would tell us what we want to watch and what we want to buy based off of our data, Right. Um, but that same expectation now is that I'm a special person, I'm coming to your organization, I'm valuable, and I help move the organization closer to our goal is really where the expectation is right now of employers. And when supply and demand is kind of flipped on its head, and the last stat that I saw was 1.8 jobs available to available candidates, right? right? So supply and demand has totally been flipped on its head, and it's in a different position than businesses are accustomed to. Um, you mentioned the work and the life. I know I struggled uh, and early on in my career. My grandfather told me and my father told me, never blend work and life. Right. Never. Just keep them very separate. Never talk about how much you make. We talked about all those unwritten rules of business that have seemingly been thrown out the window today in this very informed age or aware age. And thanks to the internet, thanks to social media, we are just more aware than ever before. But it seems like businesses are now only becoming aware of the holistic wellness and well-being of their employees, both at home and at work. And I loved your point is that the better you are in leadership, in business, of the understanding and awareness that they have a life outside of work will help you. If that's your intention, then your attention changes. Yeah. Can you kind of talk about how you at GE or any of your roles got really in tune or in touch? with what the people actually wanted and how you drove or delivered that message to the top of the business. Yeah, I think that, you know, the good thing about GE is that, you know, you had leaders that were, would listen, okay? If you had credibility and you had a reputation of, of delivering in your job, getting stuff done or however you want to describe it, it was a good thing. And, and I felt like I was fortunate with the teams that I was around, you know, we were able to work some pretty good problems and, and people would listen to us. And I can remember, you know, at GE, we were making a major change in our, in our benefits platforms, and, and there were some things that we were negatively impacting folks out in the field, number one, folks that were, you know, mid-pregnancy. So you're in, you know, you're, you're pregnant, but you're not going to deliver until the, the new benefit platform kicks in. And there was some major downside for folks with that. And as we made our rounds, it was, you know, people were emphatic about it. You had male employees, the father saying, wait a second, this is going to, this is going to impact my family and female employees. And and when we got the facts, and again, get the emotion out, get the facts, let's talk about it. We looked at the numbers and said, okay, what does that mean? They changed what the original intent was. And so I felt like the fact that my team had that credibility out in the field, that they knew that we had our finger on the pulse. They knew that we didn't just react on emotion. We wanted to talk specifically about big ticket items that were going to be a you know, major downside for folks in the organization. And the company listened and did different by it, okay? You know, as, as my career evolved, I saw ops leaders, you know, it, it, GE was a very metrics oriented company. It was a company where you had to deliver and you were held accountable to that. But people found out, that, you know what, I, I don't want to be a till of the hunter. I, I want to 
I want to make my numbers, but I want to make my numbers with folks who are helping us get there by doing it the right way. And so it was a pleasure to work with folks who, who thought that and said, hey, look, let's, let's make sure that we look at the calendar and let's not start anything on Father's Day or Mother's Day or, you know, big things that are coming up that we know, are, you know, graduation weekend or, you know, religious standpoint, First Communion weekend, things like that, that, that were important to people, you know, or, the religious holidays that are across the spectrum to say, hey, we're, we're, we're conscious about this and we want to make sure that you know that. So as we move forward, we're trying to be collectively responsible for what all you have going in your life outside of work. So when you focus on work, you can get it done and get it done well. Gosh, and, and, and the, the, just the, not just talking through emotion and making emotional decisions, Mark, was like one of the most, I think I got goosebumps when you said that because that gets us kind of into that data data mindset, right? And, and data and science to drive business decisions. But one of the stats out there is that only 22% of businesses use data and science to drive business decisions, that most it's are relying changing. on that. It's changing for the better and it's changing because, you know, we're, we're smarter about it. I think that you know, I grew up in the day where HR was kind of the health and happiness brigade, okay? You, you, you planned the holiday party, you, you made sure somebody got a dental form, and, and that was kind of it, right? And as long as you did those things, it was cool. But, but it, in the late 80s, early 90s, it changed in GE where, look, if, if you wanted to seat at the table, you had to earn it, right? And when you got there, you had to demonstrate your ability to stay there. And I think that was the big deal. And when you said, okay, how can I help? And I can think of you know, the, the, the biggest game changer for me was first off, as I mentioned a couple of times, G very metrics oriented. So if you're an HR person and you're walking to a meeting with a bunch of finance and operations people and you're, you're asking them to make an investment into something, a couple hundred thousand dollars or whatever, million dollars into something, and you're going to tell them it's your gut feel that we'll be better, we'll all feel better if we do it this way, they're going to throw you out of the room. Okay, they're gonna say what? Exactly. So exactly. The, the first time that I I can recall where you know data made a difference for me was when I went to Europe and you know I, I go to Europe I'm am an American the Europeans feel like I don't even speak English they feel like I spoke broken Southern American English and I, and I go to serve 650 sales and marketing people in 13 countries Europe India and South Africa. And they're, they're, they're looking at me like, why? Why in the world would GE send you over here? You can't even speak in our language. You know, you, you don't even speak the mother queen's English. And, you know, why are you here, right? And I, my very first meeting, I introduced myself. And one of the leaders stood up and said, let me give you my definition of human resources. Neither human nor resourceful. Because <laughs> that's when you start with me. And he sat out and I thought, man, why? This is going to be a tough egg. So then I got back to basics. Sir, I'm going to come to your, I want, can I spend a week with your business and, and travel with you and see your customers and meet your team and sort of doing that and kind of learning from it. Well, the biggest, the big challenge we had before us was our sales and sin compensation plan. And it, it was anecdoted, it, it, was, it needed to be changed. It, the, the, back then, the euro hadn't come in yet, but it was coming. And we had to get to a front where we, had, we were paying in all these different currencies, but we were paying different per country and then a lot of European manufacturers were starting to come to the U.S. to manufacture because it was cheaper than it was to do it in their own country, Mercedes and BMW for starters. And so we had to do something different. And so I said, here I am. I don't speak the language. I'm talking about these folks pay, which was, you know, the incentive compensation was about 40 percent of their pay. And so how are we going to do this? So I went and had a great colleague. It was a, a, a Dutch guy who spoke six languages fluently, who was as smart as a get out guy. And I said, Help me. Let's get the data. Let's talk about what we're going to do. And let's you and I figure this out. And we did. And he and I went on a road show throughout Europe and talked about the whys and hows. And we got into the numbers and we showed the numbers and they couldn't argue with the numbers. And it helped us get to where we are. And uh, we, you know, we, we, we kind of went from there. And so my personal credibility with the group went up because they're like, OK, you helped me with my pay. Now I understand. This gentleman ended up taking my role when I left, and it really helped him from his standpoint because he kind of stepped in the role with some credibility, and it was a, a big winner for me. So I thought numbers matter. Remember this: numbers, numbers will can be your friend. I love it. And kind of went off that. And, and again, when we pitched the story, the story took because people understood the story by the numbers, not by saying, "Well, we ought to do it this way in Austria. We ought to do it this way in Italy." And no, no, here's why we have to do it this way. And here's how we're going to do it. And they're like, everybody signed up. That's great. 
I, I, you know, you've heard the old adage, love is a universal language. I think data is now the universal language, right? Uh, help us get it, there. Helps, it helps tremendously. So, Mark, I think um, we'd probably be remiss if we didn't bring up the next topic because it's been in the news and we've seen a lot of, I will say, large corporations who have had some unionizing efforts going on within the, you know, within their within their corporations. And just, you know, given your background, your expertise, where do you see, you know, where are we right now from a working landscape when it comes to unions and the kind of the, the reemergence of unions and, and what's going on? You know, what, what are you seeing? And, you know, where do you think this is actually going to go to? I think it's an interesting scenario that's happening today. And I think it's unlike any that we've ever seen before. I think that you got kind of the perfect storm. I said, you, you got... COVID and, and how a lot of things changed in work and people were either forced out of their job on, on you know, on a temporary leave or, or, or could work from home. And then you had the changes of people not wanting to come back to work and the whole, you know, terms and conditions of jobs. You got politically things change every time the administration changed from Republican to Democrat. And, you know, there's been some commitments made on behalf of the current administration to, to kind of bring build, build back the, the middle class and to do that through through the unions. And then you have a, a group of folks who really don't understand what it all means and what it is. And so when you throw all those things in the hopper together, it's, it's an, times unlike any we've ever seen. You know, because of my role at GE, where I was very much involved in helping GE maintain union free status proactively, but also reactively. And, and we had the most fun with it on the, on the proactive standpoint. But when we had, uh, you know, opportunities to, you know, maintain our union free status, we, we did it and we did it pretty well. So had that reputation. So I get a lot of people calling a lot of the big players today that are experiencing challenges uh, I've, I've talked with because they've, they've asked for opinion. You know, I know some of the key players that are working campaigns in some of these organizations and, and, and it's really different. I mean, it's all about, you know, work life balance. It's all about my schedule. It's all about things that in the past you know, mattered a little bit, but it was, all, it was always pay and paid time off and pensions and things like that in the past. Now that's not what it's about. And so I think that you've got a group of people, uh, you know, a lot of young people, their first job in the workplace that really don't know what all this stuff is. They may have a great uncle at Christmas or Thanksgiving. Yeah, back in the day of the union, we did this and we yeah. did that. And every one of us, our benefit package that we have today is it has been enhanced as a result of unionization in America. Okay. My sense is they certainly have served their purpose. And I think that if leaders fundamentally lead, okay, and they earn that right to lead every day, and they're open with their communication and they work with the workforce and they're candid about what's going on and, 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 and really, you know, factor business realities to how they do business with the, with the rank and file, that you can foster an environment with positive employee relations where you don't need a union, okay? But... When, when you don't have communication or, or when people are confused about what's going on or you don't tell the whole story or or your frontline leaders don't feel like they're getting the support, what they need to do their job to help supervise the people that they're supervising, then you have problems. So I think that's kind of where we're at. I feel like the, the new National Labor Relations Board is really trying to put forth some changes in labor law that have been on the books for 70 plus years. That to me is kind of scary because I think employees ought to have the choice to decide where they want to, but it ought to be a, a kind of a level playing field. I think you're trying to change the kind of the balance of the playing field. But to me, it fundamentally, it boils down to do, does the workforce trust their leader? Do they feel like their leader cares for them? You know, from a standpoint of what's going on in their life at work and outside of work. And, and, and when we face challenges with the business, are we open and honest about what's going on and collectively working together to problem solve for that? That's good. Yeah, and I think when people feel that they have that going on, they'd much rather deal directly with their leadership team as opposed to have a third party come in, in some cases whose agenda may not align with what the business is trying to do to be successful. Exactly. So, you know, I always tell people, if you ever get a union, you've earned it. You've earned that from something you've done or not done. And, yeah. and to me, I, I love talking with people about well, what can I do proactively? through leadership training, through communications, through, you know, site assessments, through really understanding what's happening in the organization, but doing something about it. Don't wait till the fight breaks out to try to fix a problem. You know, your problem's going to come up every day. Yeah. You got you to have your list and work your list every day. And if people see you doing that, 
and the credibility of you, you know, working things toward completion, they'll, they'll stand with you. They'll, they'll work with you. That's good. I love that. And I love, I love your part, Mark, about being proactive. I, I, I find most businesses, especially HR, just because of the percentage of their time focused more on administrative tasks rather than, than, than transformational. Right. So less on the strategic, more on the tactical. And like to your earlier point, their availability to employees isn't there. You mentioned uh, GE was so in tune with those critical life events is what I would call those within a birthday, an anniversary, a first communion, those critical life junctures that we have a very emotional response to as an individual. Just having that employer understand that it's in a very emotional time and there they are supporting and saying, hey, we're here with you. Um, probably drove that engagement and why um, the individuals within GE did not collectively all come together to, to say we need to unionize. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, again, we, 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 had, we had losses, we had places where, you know, mostly it was with acquired companies that, that mm -hmm. you know, came in with an expectation of what they thought they were going to get and it was different than what they imagined and we had to walk through that. But I think the bottom line is people are people, okay? I mean, it's, to me, it's no different. If I, if I if I go to the if I have a recall on my car and I and I say I call up and I say, hey, look, I'm bringing my car in. Yeah, we got the part. We'll get it done. Okay, what time is it going to be ready? Five o'clock. Great, I'll be there at five. Do I need to call? No, nope, it'll be ready at five. Then I show up at five and it's not ready. I'm not happy about it. Employees okay. are no different. Okay, mm -hmm. we got to do what we got to say we're going to do when we say we're going to do it. If things change, let's talk about it. But, but at the same time, let's be open and honest about what's going on in the business realities that we're dealing with. Don't wait to tell me we're having a layoff with two weeks ago, we had an all hands meeting and we were celebrating how well things are going. Exactly. Yeah. I'm going to be mad about that because yeah. what, what happened in the last two weeks? I mean, did, did it change that quickly? Did it, did it pivot that it might have depending on the nature of the business? Mm -hmm. but that's where things go awry. And I think that that trust, that credibility, and I, and I learned so much. I was so blessed in my career with people that were my client managers, where I learned so much about watching them interact with the workforce and watching them tell their story and watching them do what they got to do. It was just incredible that said, man, these guys, I got to do that same thing, right? Yeah, I do that yeah. same way. That's great. Mark, I think, uh, you know, as we look at how we all learn and how we grow, you had some fantastic mentors and just some, you built a lot of fantastic relationships. I'm curious, you know, through the course of your career, were there any moments where maybe you learned through making a mistake, any any kind of, you know, oops, you know, yeah. situations that you had that kind of helped you learn and, and, and change maybe certain ways that you were doing things? Yeah, so I, this was a, this is kind of a, I'm gonna chair, tell it generically because when okay. I, I had was promoted to a role in a facility that was huge. This facility was, over 2,000 employees. The factory was over a million square feet wow. of floor space. And the place made a, a very high demand product that was just, I mean, they, they worked every Saturday. I mean, you know, they, they always had overtime. It was just a well-run place that high demand for the product. But when I took the job, my predecessor had actually been removed from his role. And, and they told me going in that there were going to be some problems, right? And I'm like, what do you mean there's going to be some problems? There's going to be some problems. Like, well, can you elaborate? You'll, you'll find them when you get there. So I get there and I'm like, oh my lord, you know, every day it was like, I mean, talking about major stuff. I'm like, I'm not, I'm talking about major stuff. Where we had two members of the leadership team who, who exited from the business. We had, you know, misappropriation of funds. We had sexual harassment. We had just a lot of things going on that shouldn't have been going on. So the first six, eight weeks on the job, I'm getting the facts. I'm digging through it. People go, facts, investigate, review, out. You know, I'm like. I'm new sheriff in town, but I got, I'm picking this up. So we get 2,000 people. We get in, and at, at, at the end of the six, eight weeks, about nine people were terminated, right? And I'm thinking, I am the man. I'm yeah. here, I'm in charge. I'm telling my boss up the road, I'm in, I got no control. So I decided I'm going to go out and meet some of the hourly population. So I got on the second shift, and this is an assembly line operation. And I walk out on the line and the first person I walked up to, I didn't know it at the time, but she was a long service employee who chose to work on second shift. And I walked up and I said, hi, uh, I'm Mark Guthrie. I'm your new HR manager. I'd like to introduce myself. And she says, please do not talk to me. And I'm like, what? I'm new HR. She said, I know who you are. She said, you've been here for eight weeks. Everybody you talk to, you have fired. She said, go talk to somebody else. <laughs> back to work. 
And I'm like, oh, well, and then I got to thinking about it. And I thought, she's right. Yeah. Here I am, 2,000 people. We had a very, very, very small part of the population that was doing stuff they shouldn't have been doing. Yeah, yeah. Needed to be taken care of, and I took care of it, but I forgot about everybody else. I wasn't out meeting everybody else and seeing what was going on and thanking people for what they do and their presenteeism and all these good things. I was held in on getting out the, the bad apples. Yeah. And I forgot about the, you know, the 1,990 good apples. <laughs> and they're like, oh my God, if that guy comes over and touches you on the shoulder, it's yeah. the Gloom Reaper coming yeah. to get you and yeah. you're gone. And I thought, oh my Lord, I got to I gotta do different. I got to do different. I, I needed to do that part of my job. Yeah. But more importantly, the part of my job was catching people doing things right versus taking all my time to find somebody doing something wrong. That's and I said, I got it. I moved my office out to the shop floor. We had this thing called the People Center out on the shop floor. And I thought, you know, again, got on with the softball team, different things to say, I, I'm digging myself out of a deep hole here. These folks think that I'm, all I care about is guns a blazing, yeah. not promoting the positive things that are happening in the organization. And I think it took some time, but I said, never again, never yeah. again. I'm, I, we're going to, we're going to resolve the issues that we have. We're going to do that, you know, expeditiously and confidentially, all those things, but we're not going to forget about the people who help us be successful and, and, and reinforce that. So that's kind of my, you know, a, a hard, tough lesson learned, but it was a good, I, I went back and thanked her a month later and said, for having the courage to say that. Yeah. 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 Say, I mean, she looked at me like, like, like are you kidding me? <laughs> no way. Yeah. Go talk to somebody else. I love it. That's wow. great. But I, I think just your understanding, Mark, that uh, people's perception is their reality. Is. And, 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 and back to your earlier point about the importance of communication. Um, we've seen it. A lot of employers that, that may survey, uh, they make changes, but they never communicate why they made those changes from the okay. surveyed information or, um, any well, other decisions that, there's things that people want changed yes. we don't address it correct it just, it just sits there well what about well, we're not going to do that well, why aren't we well let's talk about why we aren't maybe maybe they'll better understand why we're not but if we just let it lay over here and don't even talk about it yep. and it's like they, they didn't hear us we heard yeah. it we're just not going to do it well why yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. Gonna do it? and nothing more frustrating obviously when, when everybody today just wants to be listened to valued and heard right. and and i think the communications is, is really um that missing link to to true full engagement for a lot of organizations and to your point there's employers that offer benefits there's uh, employers that offer uh, remarkable compensation strategies and, and and executive benefits um but what i have seen and i was just curious if you have seen it on your side is that just the lack of understanding or true understanding of that employee value proposition due to that poor communication, sometimes their, their perception of what reality actually is, is, is totally off as an individual employee. Have you seen that in some of your work just because of the poor communication? And not I, have, I have, I'll tell you, you know, one, one of the questions that you guys said you might ask me was what, one of my favorite books. And there's a book called The Education of Ronald Reagan. And it's not to be political. But it's the education of Ronald Reagan, the GE years. And people didn't realize that Ronald Reagan worked for GE back in the late 50s and the early 60s. And his role was to go around GE, the country, and talk to employees about the value of the GE job. Wow. And pension and all, you know, all these things that people had paid time off and all these things. And, and, and it came back to help, you know, Reagan was known as the great communicator. And it's not about politics. It's just about what, what this role was. And Ray, Reagan worked for a guy by the name of Lynn Bolwer. And when I left GE, part of my role, not all of my role, was the role that Lynn Bolwer had. Okay. So you connected the dots. But what I learned from that was exactly what you're talking about, Kevin, is like making sure people understand their total job package and what it all means and how it works and how they can apply this and apply that. And, and so there's, there's not confusion because we'd have people mad about something they didn't even know they didn't have or, or had. Yeah. And how it all worked. And how we can make it play but more importantly things evolve over time and what might have been important back in 1965 in you know, 2005 is not as important and it yeah. needs to be modified and tweaked and being able to have those kind of dialogues and so when that book came out i went and read that book and i thought oh my gosh first off it was kind of like looking into the the history of part of my role sure and also you know reagan being the great communicator he had he attributed his ability to communicate to what he learned working for Lynn Bolwer going around GE wow. for almost eight years. 
preaching the gospel of GE's benefits and so forth. And then when he ran for president, a lot of those people voted for him. They remembered him when he came around. Yeah, that's and he, that's why he, you know, he got some states that he traditionally probably wouldn't have pulled was because of those interactions he had with people back in time. So I think what you're saying is spot on is making sure we're open about it, knowing that we have to be, you know, everything's not etched in stone. Times change, things change, you know, now flexible work, work schedules are more important now than ever. And we demonstrated with COVID that some people can work from home, but not everybody can, you know, hurts. You got to wash your car at the, at the garage at the airport. You can't do it at your house in your driveway. Yeah. Yeah. The customer service agents have to be there dealing with the customer directly at the counter sort of thing. But where we were some things that we thought before we never could do now, maybe we can. Yeah. And, 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 and does that keep people on the payroll because they couldn't, otherwise they couldn't stay, you know, all those things come into play. And I think that if you don't have that dialogue and it's both team wise and business wise communication, but it's also on the, on the individual level, you know, some people got away from having individual conversations. Right. We're naturally conflict of orders. Okay. People would sit there, Oh God, conflict, Can I get a cup of coffee and go work it out. I don't want to talk about it. Yeah. 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 You, you got to talk about it. The longer you let it go, the worst is going to bring other people in and create a problem. And I think that, that the leaders who take those things on, that's the ones I want to work for, not let things fester. Let's get it out there, talk it through, figure it out, move forward. Yeah. I see. I just see Mark so many people attacking the symptoms and not the actual disease itself. Well, and, and then they don't get a sustainable solution. It's not a yeah. root cause. It's throw a band aid on it, not figure out, cut the cancer out, and then let's go. And you say, oh, that's not cancer. You know, it's yeah. just a bad sore. Yeah. And that's the deal. You got to, you got to get to the root cause of it again. And, and numbers can help you get there. You know, HR analytics can help you get there and then put in a sustainable solution that helps these things not to recur. Cause part of your credibility can be eroded with the same thing. Mm -hmm. that's what, we went through that last year, last summer, we had the same problem. Why are we doing it again this year? Yeah. So right. Right. Yeah. yeah. I see the same things every time the HR puts up on their whiteboards too, Mark, is that they have all these strategic initiatives, but 90% of their time is administrative and the same things keep making these lists year over year over year. And I'm telling them that you're deteriorating your own trust and reputation if, by doing that. So yeah, I, I love those points that you're making. But I split things up though, Kevin. I had, I had the day-to-day -day we had to use and I had the team that was doing the day-to-day, -day, but I always had my team of, of the project folks that were the strategic things to help us get down the field and put points on the scoreboard in the future, not today. Mm -hmm. and, and, and those folks were learning a, a ton of stuff in the process, but it also got us to partner with operations, with finance, with IT, with whomever, to say, how are we going to go make this thing happen, how make this happen, and make it happen collectively working together where it wasn't the HR project, if you want to left just HR, it'll go exactly. away, you know, they'll slow yeah. down and forget about it. In six months. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's great. Mark, I'm looking at the time and we want to thank you. One last question. We typically ask this of all of our guests. I'd love to get your perspective on it. You know, tell us where do you think the future of work is going? We've seen tremendous changes over the last two years. You know, what can we expect to see over the next, you know, two, three years as we look ahead? I think times unlike we've ever seen. I think if you just look at the last 24 months, 30 months and, and how much things have been different, I think it's going to be the same going forward. I think the, the politics in America, unfortunately, are going to come in here and, and play in this, which I hate because I just, to me, I, I'm not a political guy. I just want to just, just get stuff done and let's just work it through together to make it happen. But I think from, from the standpoint of the expectations of the employee and what he or she wants in his or her life, the whole social aspect of, of work that's, that's come into play at work and how we have to manage ourselves through that. So you, it's just not your grandfather's HR kind of role. It's, it's different. But it's different for all the functions. And I think the yeah. fundamental things still hold true. I think open, honest communications. I think understanding your business. I mean, for people who work in an operation and you can't, you can't read the balance sheet or understand how they make money or, or what, what does the company deem to be success and what yeah. does that look like it is critical. And I think as long as you focus on those things and you're open to you know, be, being to, to different than what yesterday was, that it's going to be fun to be involved with, but I, but I think it's going to get more challenging. I think that, you know, legislation is going to change on the union front to make things easier for companies to organize. And yeah. I, I, I don't think that's a good thing, but you know, others might, but 
But I think all these things are going to come into play. But to me, if it's somebody's thinking about a job in HR, could be more more of a fun time to do it. Could be more of a fun time. Couldn't agree. Couldn't agree more. It's not your grandfather's HR anymore. Mark. I love that. And yeah. the points that I always take with, with Chris, Chris knows that uh, when we have conversations, I always say you better know how do you make money, how do you lose money, and where you spend it because Absolutely. that's how you find out where you should be focusing your attention on to to drive to drive the business forward and have your impact on the bottom line to to help with that accountability standpoint. If you don't, so, if you don't know that you you automatically have half the room not going to listen to. You. Correct. You're not helping me. So. And then you're talking on a more emotional terms and finance individuals are typically not very emotionally driven individuals. So right. now here is a, oh, that's a nice to have or a feel good thing. And no, right. it's actually, no, it drives the bottom line. Uh, but I, I just can't connect that dot because I don't know what that looks like. So yeah. I think I, 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 I can't thank you enough for saying yes to, to agree to be a part of the show. I have 18 pages of notes. I think <laughs> I wrote a small novel after this, um, but uh, this was really, really uh, awesome. Uh, lecture conversation. You got me excited, fired me up for the rest of the day, because um, this is why we do this HR evolution, the revolution of HR for the evolution of business. And here we are as it's HR's opportunity to become those business leaders that business needs them to be right at this moment in history. So I appreciate you all reaching out, Chris. Thanks for the connect. It was good to catch up with you and know what's going on with your family and uh, look forward to hear from you guys sometime in the near future. So thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Wish you the best. Bye-bye.